I'll explain it in the uh, the intro of what I kind of want to talk about is when I get into what we uh, think is going to happen in the future and then within the next five years. And I think that we all have a pretty good idea of what to expect. So um, I'm going to try and run it for maybe like an hour and a half. Might go over a few, um, just depending on where the conversation leads. So um, the record. I can hear an echo in the background a little bit. Yeah, quite a bit. It stopped. Is it uh, Ryder, it's when you talk, I think, because there's an echo there. You think it's me? I hear you fine. Okay, good. The echo did stop right then after I noticed that. Okay. David, how you doing? Cool. Doing well. Been a long time since we had a chat, hasn't it? Yeah, we ought to have we ought to get together sometime. And thank you, Ryder, for having us on. You're completely welcome, and I appreciate all of you guys. Uh, I'm just gonna do my little intro here and introduce all of you and then we'll kind of get into it. Did you hear in the echo now? Yes. Chris thinks it's coming from uh, from Jay. Is your uh... almost got it solved. <laughs> <laughs> Dramony? Yeah, I like the bookshelves in the background of both. Yeah. Oh. Jay Penny, you gotta like the bookshelves in the back. See, that's the way we're yep. gonna have to operate is going back. In case we lose the internet to have these skill sets of building things and gardening and yep. repairing and oh canning God, and yeah. fermenting and these kind of things. We're going to have to book, tons of books about that. Yeah, uh, this is only my working library. I have another whole library that's like twice the size. So I've been collecting books for a long time. I like to read and uh, I am all over the place in terms of my interests. So you see, I watched the Twilight Zone. I remember what happened to the librarian. Wow. Uh -oh. I never, ever watched TV. What happened? <laughs> <laughs> who, was the guy, uh, who was the guy who played the librarian of that? Burgess um, Meredith. Thank you, Jay. Yes. Where the end of the world came and he loved books. And uh, so he got his wish. But the only problem is he broke his glasses. Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> the small All things right. in life. Uh -huh. All right. Does this uh, sound better now? Sound good. Sound good? All right. Perfect. I'm going to roll it. Hello, and welcome back to Raised by Giants, where we talk all things spirituality. I'm Ryder Lee. Tonight is a very special roundtable discussion for my 100th episode, and I have brought uh, people on here tonight that have helped me a lot in these uh two years that have tons of knowledge very well well respected and honorable people i can really find in this space that i've had on my show several times and have brought me on their shows and first up is my co-host he is a host of creator and creator of forbidden knowledge news and the forbidden knowledge network chris matthew good to see you my friend thanks for coming on Hey, man, thank you so much for having me. been looking forward to this. And I don't honestly don't know what I'm doing here. All these guys are experts and amazing researchers in doing what they are doing in their field. So I'm just uh, honored to be here amongst them. So thank you. And our Mark. first panel member is David Dubine. He is the creator of Adapt 2030 channel on YouTube. He discusses energetic changes on Earth as the sun repeats its 400-year cycle of low activity, affecting global crop production and economy of everyone on our planet as society resets. Hello and welcome back, David. Good to see you, my friend. Thanks so much for coming on. Yeah, thank you. I'm here as much to listen and learn from others as to participate in the conversation. So, I'm just going to sit back and absorb unless uh, something falls into my lap that's of my research. Otherwise, I'm here to listen as much as, as anybody else would. Thanks for having me on. And hello Thanks to so everybody much, else. <laughs> Wish I could uh, shake your hands. Hey, 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 hey everybody. <laughs> Next up is Wayne Steiger. He is a philosopher, researcher, educator, spiritual teacher, and visionary on occult and esoteric studies and many other topics he dives into on his YouTube channel at Wayne Steiger. Hello and welcome back to the show, Wayne. Thanks so much for joining us here today. 
Thank you, Ryder, for having me on. I uh, feel humbled in the uh, audience of such greatness here, but uh, thank you. Uh, it's exciting and it's exciting times we live in. Absolutely. Thank you, Wayne. Next is Jay Widener from Reality Check. He is a renowned filmmaker, author, scholar, writer, and director, considered to be a modern day Indiana Jones for his worldwide quest to find clues to mankind's spiritual destiny via ancient artifacts, societies. He's been featured on the History Channel and has produced original content for Gaia TV. Hello and welcome back to the show, Jay. Thank you hey, so much. Nice to see you. Nice to see everybody. And uh, uh, it's finally raining in Colorado after nine dry months. So it's a good day. <laughs> it just snowed. It snowed in Denver, didn't it, the other day? Yeah, it's raining right now. So it's, it's a serious pleasure. You have no idea. <laughs> And next up, we have Penny Kelly. She is an author, teacher, publisher, consultant, neuropathic physician, and researcher of consciousness. You can find her work on her YouTube channel, Penny Kelly. Hello and welcome back, Penny. Thanks so much for coming on. My pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me. I am glad to be here and excited about the conversation. Thank you all for joining me here today. I really appreciate your time. I believe that I have uh, assembled the best panel ever on the internet and I have a lot of things to talk about and hopefully the audio is sounding okay whenever this thing gets taken down. Um, but we have a lot of things to talk about based on what's happening in the world today. I believe uh, we are in for one of the biggest collapses in history. We have so many things happening at the moment, distractions, agenda after agenda, magnetic pole reversal in progress, true new north moving by day, grand solar minimum, uh, food processing plants being burnt to the ground, it seems like every week now. Food prices have nearly doubled since 2020, gas prices at an all-time high, threats of war, and of course, they're pushing the, the new boogity boo, uh, like we knew that they would, of course. But um, I brought you all on here today to talk about what we can expect in the next uh, five years uh, globally. So, David, let's start with you, and because uh, you've been researching the Grand Solar Minimum and how to keep up with uh, global food crop production during this uh, Grand Solar Minimum period for a long time now, and what have you been seeing as of late with the sun? Well, it does look like it's going to be a little more intense than what the news media is letting on at the moment. You know, if you put it into the grand scheme of things, they're talking about a 20% decline in global wheat production this year. But that's only from the Ukraine, the Russia, and the Black Sea fiasco going on with the escort or the uh, export embargoes, the sinking of the grain vessels out there, the mining of the Black Sea, and then the ports are closed. That's factor A, but the elephant in the room, nobody's really talking about except ag news right now is the fertilizer shortages. And they're putting that at 20% globally this year. Original research was at 13%, but they apparently have upped it to 20% now. So if you do a single one-to-one -one calculation that fertilizer application reduction is the same percentage of your crop yield reduction as you as you decline in the fertilizer. So if there's a 20% reduction in application on the field, you're going to get a 20% reduction in your yield coming out of that acre or hectare. So now work the math with the wheat minus 20%. Now the winter wheat that was planted back in November and December that overwintered through winter and is now emerged doesn't really count for that. We're going to start from spring wheat forward right now. So anything that's gone into the ground in the last month, month and a half, depends on where your latitude is. Uh, there's a lot heavier losses coming. So the numbers we, that I'm willing to put out publicly now are 35 to 40% global reduction in wheat, 35 to 42% reduction globally in corn, and 15 to 18, possibly 19% global reduction in coffee output this year. And then the oats also will have record high pricing because uh, electromagnetically, it's strange where these outbound hill currents are exiting out of, say, 40 degrees north latitude around Russia and the Oblast region. 
uh, the major oat producer of the world is right there. So they're having disturbances in localized weather from electromagnetic field, like outbound currents intensifying. So the local systems are behaving strangely. But now you have to really wonder what's going to happen when 40% of the world's wheat disappears, 40% of the corn disappears. How's that going to upset the balance of the world? How will people respond? And then how are governments going to respond to that? So I think we already get a, a, a slight glimpse into what's happening on the response, the stimulus, and then where do we go from here through 2023 and the end of 2022? Wayne, uh, do you think that this is a, a, a manufactured event that they're intentionally causing this kind of uh, shortage that's, uh, that we're seeing right now? Yeah, I would agree. Uh, and, and David, I would agree with you as well. I mean, the baby formula shortage here in the United States is a prime example of this. This is a self-contrived event. It was been in the planning since January. And this is just one of many incidences. Um, you know, we're all aware of 21 plants now that uh, processing plants um, I've heard direct reports from people who work with Walmart. Um, they work in the major distribution centers that they were on average receiving 100 to 107 trucks a day into these distribution centers. They're now down to about eight. Um, just today on one of the prepping channels, they were reporting that Sam's um, is now stocked above normal, but this is because this is what they ordered eight months ago. It's just now getting there. And the manager has been told after this is gone, there isn't anything in the pipeline because we get most of our material from China. This includes, for instance, injectable dye for if it diagnoses, if you've got cancer or what have you, that's made in Shanghai just like the chips are. And we know that the Chinese, this is actually economic war. We're at war with China. They shut down their ports purposely. And so the effect, much like David was saying with the harvest, it, it's, it's coming. And when it hits, I think it's going to be the, the holy mother of all coincidences where everything coalesced at the same time at the same place. And that's ugly. When could I jump in? Excuse me, everyone. Can I jump in for a second here to sure, add on that? So I work as a, a consultant for the dairy industry, also part-time from California. And the thing is, as was explained to me, the corn affects the output of the dairy, the lack of corn. But this whole purposeful drought that seems to be going on as an engineered drought out west has also affected about 300 other agricultural uh, streams, if you will, for a better term. And those streams, the byproducts coming off of that are also reformulated into a dairy cattle feed. So they're out in Indiana and Ohio looking for corn to take it back into California because they can't grow right now, but they can't get the rail traffic. So how does that affect mothers and baby formula? Well, if you look at milk in the dairy industry itself, when they, or you go into a store and they're selling milk, that's the lowest value of anything in their process and their entire vertical, uh, uh, how they're going out to market. The milk is the bottom of the barrel, literally. Their cash is from whey, whey proteins for the cheeses, and then those upper end proteins that are for infant formula. That is the highest creme de la creme. And excuse me, hit that with my foot there. But uh, that dairy, they're ceasing and going down to incredibly minimal operations. They're at the point now of trying to refine rail car capacity to move the cattle out of California because the food is coming down to a minimum. And then the California animal cruelty laws are saying, if you don't feed your herd in three days or diminish a certain amount of calories out of that, you have to euthanize them. And they're like, no, it takes three years to bring these cows up. We're at full production. And now we're trying to move, I'm not gonna, thousands and thousands of cows out of California but that infant formula, the way it looks now, it's not gonna solve itself because the base product of the dairy industry that goes in for that infant formula is just terminating at this point. And to add on to that, um, so my brother who is in Missouri, 
knows his friend is a farmer. He grows corn and soybean. Um, he can't get the corn seed because they're regulated by FDA that they can only plant a certain kind of corn, which requires a specialized fertilizer. Uh, they can't use the same fertilizer for the corn that he has with the soybeans because that requires a special formula of fertilizer. Uh, he said his cost last year was running about $300 an acre for the uh, fertilizer, seed and what have you, fuel. That cost today has now exceeded $3,700 per acre. His fertilizer he can't get, but even if he does, he could get it, has actually increased in some cases tenfold. Uh, he can't, the, the, the problem on diesel fuel, we're not talking about this, the, he can't, it's no longer profitable for him to, like he said, to plow the fields. He can't afford the diesel. In Missouri, that diesel is going for 507 a gallon. Last year at this time, that same price was about 305 a gallon. So anyway. And the herbicides, if I might jump in, the herbicides are also thin this year. There's a global herbicide shortage, which is what you referred to, Wayne, glyphosate. When they plant those rows of corn, that's why it's called GMO Roundup Ready, because when they're planting the corn, and believe me, I'm not a fan of glyphosate. I'm really not a fan of any you know, chemical herbicides, so I'm not on that side of the fence. I'm just saying this is the way it's done currently in, in large agribiz. They don't have the Roundup or the glyphosate to run in the rows, because if you're going to put a fertilizer on a plant, you're going to go for the target species which would be corn during emergence. But if you have all these other weeds in the fields, that's gonna pull away from the nutrient that should have gone to the roots of the corn to grow it to head and ear, but it's not. So now you have an entire field sharing what should be 100% uptake in corn or wheat or soy, but now it's sharing with all these other plants. So again, it's not exactly a one-to-one -one on that. It's more like a 0.8. So if you're gonna reduce the number of gallons that you're applying to an acre, you multiply by 0.8 and you'll get your reduction in yield. And they're, they're running about the similar amount of like 18 or 20% globally reduction in uh, any types of herbicides right now, because those fertilizers and herbicides are manufactured with the same base chemicals from the same base manufacturers that aren't manufacturing. So they're, they're kind of running in a parallel tandem. Now I'm hearing about insecticides, but that won't be used until later on. So could something get wiped out by caterpillar infestation or slugs or something? Yeah, for sure. So you need to add all these other factors on top too. And you can really start to take, it's a dire agricultural situation. And I just don't know how the governments are gonna to react to control angry citizens on the streets. Cause that's coming September or October at the very, very latest. That was my this question year. for- not, not years from now, months from now. That was my question for Jay. Jay, how do you think that the governments are going to uh, distract the public from realizing that these shortages right now are a real problem? I mean, we've seen how people reacted over toilet paper and paper towels in uh, 2020. How are they going to react whenever? Uh, I mean, we're already seeing it. You go into your store, the shelves are pretty dang bare now. So how do they keep this up for uh, as long as they can? Well, the, they're going to try a lot of distractions, but uh, this one's not going to, you're not going to be able to distract their way out of uh, this one. This one is going to be full force. This is um, the turning of the ages. It's uh, about 10 different cycles, as David knows, is, are coming together at once in a rather astonishing way. And um, I think, you know, we can talk about the woes, but I think at some point we need to start talking about uh, how, to, how, to, how to get out of this, because um, I, I know that the Davos crowd is meeting right now and, and they're, you know, discussing the, the regulation of the world. And um, I don't see it that way. I see us um, actually falling in to uh, decentralization. I think that, that we got to start thinking that way. I think the supply chain is proof of that. And a lot of other things are proof of that. And um, we need to start thinking that way. The same exact tools that can be used to control us are the same exact tools that we can use to liberate us and, um, and have smaller communities that are controlled and stuff. But to add to all the woes that we've already discussed, 
<clears throat> they're doing geoengineering uh, uh, in uh, Colorado, which is the watershed for five of the major rivers. There's a 30 square mile area of Colorado that is the watershed for the Colorado, the San Juan, the Platte, um, the Arkansas, and the Rio Grande. And we're not getting any rain, not hardly getting any snow, and um, and the waters are all drying out. Vegas is going to run out of water here soon, very soon, because the Colorado River doesn't have any water in it. So uh, everything is, you know, concressing at once. And I, I, I just, I think we need to be very calm at this point in time because um, things are going to get really raucous when uh, Joe Sixpack and Joan Chardonnay discover that. Uh, they don't have any food and they don't have any booze and they don't have anything. And that's coming. It's coming really soon. I think that Dave's right. It's about August, I would say. That's when everybody's going to come to the realization. Panic's going to start. Uh, they're doing this also because of the election. Um, it's all kind of been put together in a, in a little package for us all. And we have to deal with it. And I do believe that what's going on here is a um, separating the wheat from the chaff. They're, the people that are not thinking ahead, they're all going to uh, meet their fate, unfortunately. And those who do think ahead are have a chance to survive. And I think that's part of what's going on, actually. I don't know if it's a conspiracy or just a natural process. Vinny, what have you been uh, uh, shown on uh, this topic? Uh, it wasn't good. <laughs> um you know, right after Kundalini happened, that was back in 79. Um, and I started with the little men in brown robes and the visions that they brought and the experiences and the things they showed me. One of the things that was so disturbing was the malnutrition, the death, the awful things I saw. Um, people trying to get something to eat, the things they were doing to one another, they were not good. Um, it affected me very, very deeply. And I've been a farmer all my life, organic. And, um, and we were very poor. And so we lived in a very, very self-sufficient way. We built our own house. You know, we raised our own animals. We raised our own food. We made our own clothes. We fixed our own vehicles and our equipment. Um, all of that. And so when I saw that stuff way back then, it kind of said, I'm, I'm keeping, I'm keeping my roots uh, close by. I'm not cutting myself off from those roots. I mean, I did for a little while because I had a wild phase. But um, when you really start to mature, uh, and you start to see your place in the world and what the world really is, um, it's had a huge uh, impact on the work that I've done. And, and really, um, I ended up leaving engineering and going into um, the study of consciousness in order to be able to impact the way people saw this period of time right here and to encourage them and to teach them and to say, hey, um, this is a period of self-sufficiency. I don't care what conspiracy theories you have. Yeah, they're probably all true. But the bottom line is nobody out there cares except you. Care about yourself. Learn to do this. Work with people. Cooperate, cooperate, cooperate. And so um, the whole effort that I've made over my life has been to write books and educate people, educate consciousness, not telling them what to do, but, you know, this is how you might think about this and this is how you might prepare for that. And I agree with everybody else. We're coming to that moment, that come to Jesus moment, when you have to see what's really happening and you either take responsibility for what you have done or not done, or it's over. And we did lose a lot of people in the by 2025, a lot. I'm sorry. Hey Penny, when that malnutrition, was that centered in the United States here? It was global. It was global. global. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, the, know, David, the... I started watching your reports on coffee way back when on ADAPT 2030, way back when and thought, 
oh my God, there's one guy out there who sees what I see. So I've been really concerned about why, why don't people see? So I'm sorry, Wayne, I think I cut. No, you. no, I, I was just agreeing with you. You know, there was a website. It actually got uh, bought by Lockheed Martin that actually for an, and I have actually this ca steel captures of a site. They estimated between now because we're now at that time, this was back in 2016 when they were up broadcasting this, that in the United States, the GDP will drop precipitously by 78, 79% with a population reduction of approximately 202 million people. Mm -hmm. That's a third, that's a third. And, you know, and then they put this into ratio to China, to Russia, to every country's in its GDP. And what's really interesting it was the United States and Great Britain that saw the greatest reduction of its population, the United States being the first. Now, this is interesting because if you buy into what the vision that George Washington had, his third vision that he, before he passed over, he saw the United States being attacked from both shores. Mm. And I think that this is correlating into what we're about to see with China. But that's, that's just me because again, they china this, they're into this to win i don't yeah, think we are china has a demographic time bomb uh and they know it and they if they, if they don't do it, something militarily in the next three years they don't have enough men to be in an army that's is what this is the problem with russia too they're they're in a demographic time bomb and they the same thing they, if they don't do what they're going to do now, they're not going to be able to do it. However, the United States is not in a demographic time bomb. We have a lot of young people. And so um, <clears throat> and so we are being targeted, but not in a face-to-face -face war. It's a, it's a, you know, there's three phases of war and we're in the first two phases and it's serious and they're playing to for keeps and we don't even know we're in a war. I know, yeah, I shouldn't laugh. That is so it. true. It's true. Yeah. Chris, yeah, do you have anything I, uh, before we get to the next thing? That yeah, I just um, I wanted to first agree with uh, everything that Dave and Jay and Wayne and uh, Penny has said so far. Um, I think Jay's completely right. We do definitely need to focus on some solutions and uh, what we need to look forward to as a collectively in the future. But I do want to get uh, all of your thoughts on this. We're uh, experiencing unsustainable systems, what they're presenting us, it, it will crumble. It can't last the, um, everything that the agendas that they're rolling out, people are seeing through them. Um, each new thing that they're trying to roll out like monkeypox now, it, it's, I, you know, it, it seems like it's going to be a failure. I don't see people for falling for these, uh, it's medical agendas anymore, or these false flags or whatever you want to call them. And I think that it's coming to a head, especially with what people will accept in their lives. And we're also being presented with this illusion of scarcity. And they're trying to get people herded into smart cities, relying on technology, relying on big daddy government for their food and for everything else. And we're presented with, uh, well, if we have this scarcity of, of food and scarcity of supplies and all this, what are we going to do? We're going to freak out and we're going to have all these, uh, you know, riots in the street. And like Dave was saying, you know, people don't know how to handle it. When in reality, we have everything we need right at our fingertips. We have seeds. If you know how to garden, if you know how to plant, if you know how to raise your own animals, do all this, you have everything you need. It's just people are so reliant on these false systems they presented. And I think it's all, that's all part of the future agenda to hurt us all into a metaverse type reality where we are just reliant on the physical aspects of our lives. And they're trying to extinguish spirituality that goes along with it as well. But I want to get your thoughts onto that aspect where we're kind of being maybe groomed into this metaverse. You know, maybe we don't need uh, regular food anymore. Maybe GMO food will help us uh, biologically integrate with machines or whatever this future, this transhuman future that they want for us. I want to get your thoughts on that. <laughs> well, I, think, I don't think it's going to happen. I don't think I don't I think they're not going to win. I don't think I think they completely underestimate who we are 
not not the majority, but the ones that are strong and and thoughtful, I, we're not going to accept it. I don't think we're we're ever going to accept. Oh, you will own nothing and be happy. Well, I don't think any of us are going to accept it. The thing is, is that they keep putting it uh, so much uh, ante up that we're going to have to have uh, we're going to come to blows at some kind, at some point where we're going to have to say no, we're not accepting what you're doing. We're not going to accept your transhumanism. And um, uh, we're in the age of Aquarius now. So everything is breaking up. Um, we have to accept that. We have to accept that you got you got to have, find your tribe. You got to find your community of people. And uh, and I have and it, you can do it. It's not hard. And you can grow your own food. I grow much. 70% of my own food. I've got cows, I'm getting sheep. I'm, you know, I, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna surrender. I don't think any of us should. Hmm. Very good. Five chickens. <laughs> so, you know, I have to say that um, one of the things, um, you know, the government does not survive and we, it doesn't go away altogether. The way that it looked, as I was watching, you know, be, between 1980, when all of this was really being seen, and today, the first five years of 2020 to 2025, those were the, the difficult years. Um, the government collapsed, kind of regrouped, uh, went down again. Um, it began letting go of one piece of, of what it had control over for many years just was letting go of one piece or one sector at a time and until and i remember the little man in brown robe saying it will go the way of the catholic church and at the time i i thought what what the, the catholic church is doing fine um but in in the interim in the last 40 years that has um the catholic church has dwindled has lost its reputation lost its money lost its um prestige uh its ethics are in question everything about it is falling apart and i think we're going to see that same thing with the government and so the idea that i don't know if it was you wayne that triggered the thought in me i hope people are not going to rely on the government because it's not going to be there and the pieces that are there are not going to be able to do anything that's what you were talking about in our interview penny that you've seen a, a war in the united states but not so much as a civil war but a uprising of the people against the government in around 2024 to 2025 yeah, I, there are signs of that. We're moving right in that direction now. And it was the people, um, and it was global. Everybody was hungry around the globe, um, everybody. And so they were taking out their governments left and right. Um, and it actually um, started the first big aha was Canada. Um, at the time I was seeing that, I thought, no way, not Canada. Um, but it's turned out that Canada is going through this massive change and they are going to be among the first to actually say that's enough. We've, we're done with you. Um, and the, there came a point where people stood up and said, we're not paying taxes because we're, we're not giving you money to do stuff that, you know, we're, we don't want you to do. You're using it for war. You're using it for all the wrong things. What about us? And so our money was going out everywhere around the world. We see that today everywhere. So uh, we have a lot of things that we have to face, but I think Jay is right. Um, we're going to end up, uh, people are going to stand up and say, no, sorry, <laughs> I draw the line. And, and they're going to be pushed by hunger. So see, to answer your question on that one, uh, Chris, we're leaving Colorado. Colorado's unsafe. Uh, we're getting out of where we've lived for almost 20 years. We're moving somewhere east. Um, we've been prepping since 2006. So this is not anything new for us. Um, we've been, and uh, I'll just give a little tip to people out here. If you can't afford gold or silver, <clears throat> which by the way, silver's at a bargain price right now, uh, we've been doing things like buying, this case is copper. 
you can buy copper ingots because copper is going to become um, if you look at the, 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 the thing with our sun, you know, and I think Ben Davidson's done an excellent job over at suspicious observers, our sun is going to Nova. And I think they pretty well documented we're in that window now. And let's say it does Nova. Well, it's going to be a very bad day here on earth, regardless of what's happening. And if it doesn't, um, the hunger thing is real. Uh, if you, if you're not prepped by now, Unless you're very wealthy, it's going to be very expensive and it's very difficult. Uh, we run food banks and it's very difficult now to get bulk food. Uh, and the bulk food that you can get is, it's outrageous. In some cases, it's as much up as 50% from a year ago today. So I know one thing from serving time in the military, the one thing that's the most dangerous thing about a population is that if it gets hungry, because they've proven already that after three days on a person who can't eat, it's no longer civility that counts. It's what's in their belly. And I see, unfortunately, uh, a cleansing taking place in this country. And it's going to be, unfortunately, in a lot of dead bodies. Just, I mean, we just can't, we can't sugarcoat this anymore. When people get hungry in Kroger, Kroger is starting to now install security guards. They're already anticipating this. Walmart, uh, same thing. They're deploying security guards because they see what's coming down here. And I think that the August, I think it's probably going to be more like October. We won't probably see an election because they, they know what's going to happen. If there's a change of power, then what's in power is not going to be in power. And that's where things get really interesting as well. So I'll, I'll shut up here, but think about alternative type of metals. I mean, these are the type of things. It's a barter economy is what I'm trying to say. And that only happens like Jay says, if you're in a community, that's where barter economies work very well. Absolutely. And you brought up something really important. There is the threat of some kind of natural disaster. We know that they have the ability to manufacture any kind of natural disaster. And uh, David, uh, we were discussing on my show last time that uh, and you were saying that a second electromagnetic field is occurring in our solar system and will be in full effect in our near future. How will this uh, second electromagnetic field affect Earth? Yeah, before I jump into that, I'll, I'll continue on with the bulk food here. Now, if you go into your farm co-op, you can get wheat berries by the 50 pound bag for around $20 right now. And then also if you can request and get non-GMO different types of seeds like buckwheat, you can grind that into buckwheat flour, 50 pound bag right now is around $50. But the wheat berries, you can grind that into flour or you can sprout your own wheat grass so you can have micronutrients and superfood at your fingertips. Like I say, it's around 20 bucks for a 50 pound bag right now. Uh, the oats, you know, again, you could use those for food and the, the sorghum, you have to get the correct kind because some of the sorghum is only for planting for silage. But then there's the others that you can, again, grind up for like sorghum bread or you can cook it as uh, something that would be similar to rice. Millet, Japanese silver millet, you can get that by the 50 pound bag. That was around $80. I just bought a bag of that. Like for me, I'm stocking up on, I got thousands and thousands of pounds of fertilizer because now I'm at the point of mixing my own because my far farm co-op store ran out of pre-mixed. So then I'm out there buying a full bag of nitrogen, a 50 pound bag of nitrogen, a 40 pound bag of phosphorus and whatever. And then I'll just mix the ratios myself because it's just weight at that point. But if your supermarkets run out, the last place you could look for bulk is gonna be at the farm co-ops. And remember, you can't get anything less than probably a 50 pound bag out of that. And I've also heard talking to the people over there, if you have a registered farm, like I'm, my I'm farm's registered as a farm here in Tennessee, uh, you're going to get precedent. You could have 50 people waiting in line to buy whatever it is out of the farm co-op, but you walk up in front and you go, I got my farm card. And they're like, all right, everybody else out of the way. We got somebody here who's going to try to grow food for y'all. That's happening right now. So if it does come to the point of no more bulk food, please check out your farm co-op. Yes, the digital rationing cards are going to be here by the end of the year. And they're getting us more and more accustomed to having troops in the stores. 
security in the stores. The flash mob, have you noticed the flash mobs? Everybody, you know, it's in your consciousness, flash mob, flash mob. Now what happens when they flash mob the supermarkets? It's another excuse to send in security. What happens if they come in with 18 wheelers and flash mob a uh, you know, wholesale storage point out here in the countryside somewhere? Oh, we need to send the troops out in the farm fields. So they're gonna be doing this smash mob thing here and try to cause enough chaos at food storage, food delivery and food sales points where people demand that there's troops out in the countryside to save the food. They'll demand that there be armed guards inside so they can keep the supermarkets safe. This is where it's going. And, you know, the second electromagnetic field you're referring to, if you have any kind of planetary uh, software that shows the orbits where the planets are, solar system scope is a good one. It's free, just it's online. Just go to solarsystemscope.com. And as you wind out to October of 2024, you'll see that the four gas giants make a square. And this same configuration of the exact degree of arc off of the planets, the last time that it was this close with this square at almost perfect square configuration was 79 AD. Now, another interesting thing that I had been looking at, it looks like the Kabbalah with the planets. It's got the four planets, and then if the Earth is in the center, and then we have the sun, and then you got Mars, and Venus below that. And it looks like you could almost replicate it overlaying it with the Kabbalah. Now this comes back into things I've been hearing about. These elitists are waiting for this kind of planetary lineup that only happens once every few thousand years. That's it. I'm very firm in my belief of it. I will be coming out with my research shortly on that, but I encourage everybody to go look at October of 2024, right around October 25th to 28th. And what will that what will that do? Because Jay, you alluded to a changing magnetic field, and you know this awareness that we have, we've been locked into an electromagnetic field, so our sight and the auditory uh, abilities that we have as a human are locked into a previous magnetic field. Now this is going to be changing, so I think things are going to come into the visual spectrum that they're just going to startle and frighten people, where something that we couldn't previously see will become visible because of the electromagnetic field change. Now, if that's enhanced because of a second slight, and I am going to say slight magnetic field in the outer solar system, if you're counting like the uh, Anunnaki did from the outer planets inward to the Earth, then Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune are creating that second field. Then we're going to Mars, and then we're at the Earth. So we're two planets away from that new magnetic field. And if it is behaving like a Taurus wave and overlooping, it's very possible that we can get into a block wall of magnetism somewhere, even if it's just for a fraction of a second in that overlooping toroid field. How is that going to behave in a resonance wise for human perception? That's why we're seeing through everything. The elite are trying to maintain power in an old magnetic field state from the top down, the higher iron burning people alive, these kind of things, armies in wars, that just doesn't hold state. We're going to be vibrating faster and faster and faster. And it really is going to really kick off October. And I'm interested myself. I know we're going to start to see plasma displays in the skies that would look like uh, canyon wall petroglyphs coming out. The skies are going to become more electrified. Some areas regionally are going to become incredibly electrified. And I would imagine around that same time that mineral veins in the crust of our earth are going to start growing with sort of an aura. They'll be glowing outbound by uh, just the excitation of the atoms in the mineral veins. And, you know, stories of old, that's how they saw ley lines, St. Elmo's fire. This is, that's why they put all these ancient temples everywhere. They could actually see it glowing in the ground. And I really believe we're coming back into something like this in just a couple of years. Now, how do you control the populace after that happens? Everything that's been known as a control structure no longer works in any way, shape or form. So that's what I got. And I don't know if anybody else can comment on how that second magnetic field might affect humanity or our ability to see the lies in the ways that we're being farmed on this planet. Yeah, Jay, you've done a, uh, uh, sorry, you've done a lot of research into the cross of Hinde and tracked back a uh, 400 year solar storm that has the uh, potential to cause a planetary reset or a collapse of a civilization every 400 years. And we know that all the planets in our solar system are having activity right now. So when are we due for the uh, planetary solar storm? Well, I, I think it's interesting that the uh, 
the sun panel on the cross of Hende has a, a square, four objects in a square, and then the sun is expanding outwards as if it's um, being ignited somehow. And so, and that's the most important uh, symbol on the cross of Hende, I think. And uh, so I never even thought about it until he just said that the planets are going to be in a square. And I've always wondered was, was were the four objects, you know, the Peg, the constellation Pegasus, or um, were they, you know, what were they? What do they represent? And very well could be this, because Fulcanelli definitely says that the uh, end of the age is at hand and that it will be here soon. And that was in 1958. So, um, you know, it's exactly one, one generation ago. So we're, um, you know, one uh, fourth turning kind of ago. So we're, we're, we're going into this thing. And I think that we're going to, half of us are going to go completely mad. And the other half are actually going to see the world as it really is for the first time in a long time. And we will understand why the gods disappeared. They didn't disappear. We just can't see them anymore. Dave, uh, while we're talking about our magnetic field, I just want to get your thoughts on magnetic uh, north's rapid movement towards Siberia. And is this something that we need to really pay close attention to? And uh, what should we have to worry about if this should pass that, you know, this 45 degree mark, supposedly it's uh, supposed to flip? What do you think about that? Well, I, I've seen some research that shows it's speeding up. Now, this is from independent researchers. Uh, compared to what you're getting from the government swarm satellite data, compared to a network of magnetometers from an independent researcher of some 200 plus stations that are getting their own readings in completely outside of centralized control. And what they're showing as the uh, movement of the magnetic north, it's hard to say, you know, once it gets out of that locked field pattern and it starts transiting further and further and further south and also to the east. It's more like the 40 degree east mark. And then it, it, it's almost coming across, across, across itself. And once it gets into that area out of what you consider the polar regions, there's nothing really there to, to lock it in, in terms of north and south orientation. And it can pretty much move rapidly wherever it would want to go to, excuse me. But, you know, Ben, he did, a, Ben Davidson at Suspicious Observers did a bunch of research and showed that that is going to snap. If it does indeed, the south and the north meet somewhere, it's going to meet uh, off in the Indian Ocean to the west of Indonesia. So how quickly will that happen? Not sure, but governments obviously understand that this magnetic field is in play and they're either going to use it to their advantage, riding on top of a natural cycle to achieve goals faster or they're in panic mode and maybe some of these shortages we're seeing are the last ditch effort of continuity of government to prepare for the disappearance of rail cars. Where'd they all go suddenly in the last three months? Oh, maybe if they were packed and put underground, where did all these shipping containers go to? Millions of them just disappeared over the last few years. Well, maybe they were packed up and stuck underground, but you're looking at all these, the perception changes of the human race, the sun, possibly changing color spectrum to blue after this, because we've seen it go from yellow to white. Uh, John Casey, you know, was saying that with a uh, color spectrum might tinge toward blue as we get through this. And all these food crop losses, I mean, it's gonna be a time of change that nobody has seen or contemplated. And, you know, you were mentioning, Jay, these 10 cycles here. I didn't have that many culminating at one time. You know, I had, you know, five, four, five, you know, and even adding in El Nino, La Nina, the, the solar maximum, solar minimums, in addition to the multi-century, multi-millennia. But I wasn't going back 12,500 years or 42,000 years or the last interglacial on top of this cycle, but very well could be in, times of, in terms of duration on, on the powerfulness of this cycle. And also, I'll give a shout out to Mavic Observer, I mean, they're yeah, the only ones I've seen. Yeah, the 5.1 average for the last 27 months, uh, the magnetic north has been moving. Uh, we did see a brief period during the winter where it excelled at 5.7 miles in the winter months, but it has pretty well sustained a 5.1 mile drift to this 40 degree 
uh, parallel mark. Now that's, I think, kind of, you know, no one really knows, is that really the magic tripping point? But I think it's highly underrated and not reported enough what the magnetic field of the earth is actually doing to weather, what it's actually doing to humans. And we know that astronauts suffer from cosmic ray exposure, they go nuts. I have two friends that are pilots, one for Southwest, one for United, and they have reported that with the increase of cosmic rays penetrating the earth, they think it's the direct result of why passengers are losing it. Mm. Yeah, I would agree with that, actually. I think uh, if you look back at the last uh, uh, solar minimum, which is in the 1600s, there were uh, whole villages in Europe that would go crazy and, and kill each other. Literally, they would all kill each other. Uh, there was the dance craze in Europe at the time, where a single woman would just go out in the middle of the street and make herky-jerky movements, and pretty soon the entire town was doing it with no music, I mean. And uh, so there's these reports uh, 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 that were very few, but the ones that we have show that there were a lot of people were kind of nutty back then. And, you know, they're blaming it on fungal infection or fungal poisoning in the food, but... Is that really what it was? I mean, we don't know. No, that's magnetics. Consciousness is uh, frequency, period. Well, you put magnets, you put a human brain in between two powerful magnets, that person's going to go nuts. Yeah. Right. I mean, you can't handle it. At the very that's least, they'll feel sick. <laughs> At the very least. Yeah. <laughs> it's like getting hit uh, in the head the, by a bull. You know, what the hell happened? Right. The yeah. date that Maverick uh, star... Is it Maverick Star Reloader? Yeah, Maverick, uh, Star Maverick Exo uh, Reloader. Is that what it is? Yeah. Dave? He Maverick says next April. And, you know, I spent 15 years working with a plasma uh, science, with plasma science. And, and when you get fields that come together, um, they don't always merge. Instead, they come together, and if they're strong enough, um, they start dancing around one another and doing something like you were, um, I've seen you do, Jay, they, they sort of do this thing. <laughs> and they create in that swirling around alternate um, poles. And there can be, you know, six, eight, ten different poles. And those all interact. That's part of that. Um, that's just the way that fields interact. And then all of a sudden they all take a new form. And the north and south pole that we are familiar with may end up being somewhere else. And sometimes they just shoot back to where they were or close to it. Um, that's one of the first things I saw was that there was a 17 degree shift in the planet. It wasn't much, but man, it caused an awful lot of ruckus along all of the coastlines and a lot of ruckus with the, the communication system. Uh, travel, all kinds of stuff. And when you, uh, if you listen to Doug Vogt and his lectures and you watch them all, um, and he has put together what happens every 12,068 years, almost like clockwork. It's, uh, it's the Micronova thing and it is a, an EMP on steroids. And when that thing blows, you get half of the planet has compressed air when you compress a gas, the temperature goes up, and that is, it goes up like 2,000 degrees, burns everything on one side of the planet. In the meanwhile, the planet's turning. The other side, which has lost, or, you know, one side has lost its atmosphere, the other side tries to fill that in. You get 200 mile an hour winds trying to fill in where the, you know, the other side was blown away. And freezing, when you when you decompress a gas, you get freezing temperatures. So the temperature drops to, you know, 200 degrees below zero. And that's, um, it just destroys a lot of stuff. That's, uh, I mean, there's lots more to it. It's, it's a complex reaction that happens. There's a huge amount of evidence around the planet that this is something that has happened. Um, they, they talk about, Oh, we had these um, asteroids from space and one hit here and one hit there and, you know, maybe it broke up and hit in a few places. I don't think that was it at all. I think when the sun did its poof 
it just blew all kinds of debris right at one side of the planet, you know, pummels that to, to death practically um, and burns the rest of it up. It's a huge thing. You have to go inside the planet. You have to live. It's because it's 30 years before the dust settles. And that's... Have you been shown uh, something like that happening in the future, like a, a supernova or a I have sun have seen explosion? 2027. <laughs> 20, by 2027, we're seeing one of the signs that it's coming is that there's a, that the sun swells. And so when we have, um, what do you call that, an eclipse? Um, it, the, the moon or the, the, you know, the planet doesn't eclipse the whole sun. It looks like a white sidewall tire. And that, um, in some of my research with some of my students and some of my own work, I've seen that by 2027, we're seeing that right now, early stages of that are increases, huge increases in the Schumann resonance. And, um, and it just, it's a slow steady process but it gives people time to prepare and i think we need to be preparing we absolutely need that and to be thinking okay this is a big deal are I we going to survive or no i agree and uh jay do you do you think that they are uh they meaning the controllers and manipulators of our reality on a global scale are already prepared for some kind of huge natural disaster and that's why they've built these uh huge underground installations uh the the dumbs and created uh the the secret space program in preparation for some kind of large-scale global event yeah so the um the chapter on the cross of hende was added in a 1958 reprint of the mystery of the cathedrals by Fulcanelli wasn't in the original. We know the OSS, the precursor to the CIA, spent about four years after World or during World War II looking for Fulcanelli and never finding him. And um, <clears throat> um, and so as soon as the chapter comes out, uh, NASA is created about a year later, and then about three years later, the first dumb deep underground military base is dug. Uh, uh, near Omaha, a SAC headquarters. And then over the next period of time, all the way till now, we've been, seen this kind of um, funding as uh, um, um, Catherine Austin Fitz shows that they're literally missing 20, $30 trillion uh, over the last uh, 30 years. And of course, I believe it's gone into the secret space program. And I believe that the secret space program was created because they know one of the things that NASA looked at right away was uh, evidence of, of a past catastrophe, and they found it. They found it on the moon. They found all this um, uh, glass that had been formed from super high heat, and uh, they realized that the sun was not a, 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 a even-tempered star. It had moments of great outbursts, and I believe that... Um, it's not just that it's it, it's going to be a giant lightning storms is what it's going to be. I, I believe that that's what has actually really happened was we it's not going to be a Nova so much as just so many lightning storms of such a high degree that it's going to ignite forests on fire and and everything. So I'm really familiar with Doug Boat's work. I've known him for like 40 years and I really appreciate him and I like his work a lot actually and uh, have been heavily influenced by him. Um, and yes, every 12,000 and change years, we get hit with a massive um, uh, solar storm and we're due, we're, we're due for it. It's 12,000 And there are other storms in between. Yes. 6,000 right. and 3,000 and 1,500 years. Yep. And it's like yeah. a, uh, Randall Carlson just did a series of, of the fires between 1810 and 1910 in North America, where like half of Lake Michigan burned up on the on the Chicago fire. Um, these fires are where are they coming from and who's igniting them and and uh, why are they so massive and how can they burn down stone buildings like in San Francisco um, and in Boston? They were, the buildings were all stone. 
and yet they're burned down. And so, you know, there's a lot of things that we have to start looking at and wondering what's going on. And, and is a is the sun periodically lightening up places and we don't know it? And or is there something else going on? Mm. What's the probability that uh, they could be using weather manipulation technology to manufacture an event? Uh, you know, we know that they have the ability to do this. We've seen it in Texas last year. They got over a foot of snow and shut off the water and electricity. So if they can manufacture snow like that, then they can definitely manufacture earthquakes, tsunamis, hurricanes, and anything like that to fit their agenda to get people to move someplace other than where they are. What What's your guys' thoughts on that? Those are minor earthquakes, a foot of snow. That's minor stuff. When you're talking about a micronova, if the sun does its micronova, and you have this massive heat blast that hits the ocean, it instantly vaporizes 400 feet, the top 400 feet off the ocean. Now you got 400 feet of water up in the atmosphere and it comes down as snow, 19,000 feet of snow. If you're at the bottom of that, it's all over for you. That's crushing and that's how we get the glaciers. Um, the other things that happen in between where you get small compressions like Jay is talking about, and you get this massive melting all of a sudden, then you get big floods that wash away everything. The glaciers melt almost overnight. So we have to, you know, actually, Jay, it was, um, I was listening to you talk one, this is like a couple years ago, maybe, um, talking about the mystery of the cathedrals. I went out and bought the book. I thought, oh my gosh, I didn't even get 15, 20 pages into it when I thought they're talking about the, what I call the language of energy. How do you get a message across? It's in the symbolism. And that then led me to some other stuff. And, and what I have recently been trying to deal with is the uh, Hamlet's Mill and all of the myths all the way around the world they all say the same thing hamlet is a word that means the duped and we are the duped we get here we think we're building a community or we're building a, a city or we're building a corporation or whatever we're building our tower um and and then the mill starts to turn and what's the mill it's the fact that the planets and the sun are not as stable as we think and they have a regular cycle and we're into that cycle now um i've been watching the grand solar minimum creep up and noticing we used to have 80 degree weather the first week in mark march every year for maybe five days um, the last five years, we're, we're lucky to see one 80 degree day by mid-May. And that's it. Oh, we have global warming. It's like, yeah, where is it? It's not here in Michigan. So um, it's we're at a place where we really need to uh, reconnect with Mother Nature. Well, they really are um, uh, engineering the weather. There's no doubt about it. That's true. Yeah, they put barium and they drop it from commercial airlines and then it gets ionized and then they they can push it and they can push atmosphere around and that's how they're doing it. And I had a long discussion with someone who actually really understood it very well. And uh, so, yeah, they're doing that. that's what's happening in Colorado. They're making sure we don't get any clouds, any any snow, no rain. They want to dry up the river systems. Uh, you know, 20 years ago, Colorado would get, not 20 years, 30 years ago, Colorado would get 20, 20 foot uh, drifts by the side of the roads in the mountains, but now nothing, just nothing. So. Uh, Jay, since you're, you're talking about uh, Colorado, I know Wayne, myself, Ryder, and yourself are all in Colorado, and Wayne said he's leaving because he doesn't feel it's safe. Uh, would you agree with that? And where would you think would be some of the, the safest areas in the United States to be during something like this? Well, they did a study, and the safest place um, in the United States is the border of southern Colorado and New Mexico all the way from about middle of Colorado, New Mexico to the Four Corners area. Uh, I really don't know why. I have no idea why they consider that safe. Um, I get, it has water, 
it's high up. Um, but other than that, I don't know. I would not want to be uh, north of the 37th parallel, though, uh, in Colorado. I think Wayne's absolutely right. I think Colorado is going to be a frigging nightmare, especially the front range when the food crisis comes. They don't have any water either. So um, they're, they're going to have their own problems. And, they're, and yeah. everybody's moving there from California. We're getting out. We've. Um, I used to be involved very much in Republican <laughs> politics. I mean, deeply involved. And we're getting out before they are. will make it to where you can't leave the state you're in. And that I is... It's, it's, it's already, it's, uh, I've, I've got, you know, I used to do the Steiger perspective, I've got threatened uh, by some people. And so I backed off, but I can tell you, uh, Denver is, as you know, is the new capital yep. um, for the new emergence. I worked with the Federal Reserve for two years, and we, they've had, they have the reserve currency. I mean, the greenback is not going to be here, it's going to collapse. And in the midst of all this, we've got everything else. And, you know, this is, it's probably one of the best orchestrated uh, symphonies I've ever seen because we're being well-tuned and well-played uh, like a, uh, a piano. That's What's right. that interim economic step that, that they're going to use if the greenbacks no longer use it? What's that substitute going to be to bring us into cryptocurrency and carbon credits? The Amero is what I worked on, uh, David, when I was with the Fed. It was called the Amero. It it, it combined Canada, uh, Mexico, and the uh, America into the central bank. And Denver was the cap. Is the capital? It is that. the capital. In fact, if you look at it, DIA right now, yep. uh, you can't find land out there because it's all being built with new warehouses. Oh, and it's CIA's out there too. They have a <laughs> gigantic building out there. And yeah, the look at all the. Uh, in fact, we got the USGA. It's now moved here. Uh, the USDA is moving out here. Uh, we also know that the Federal Reserve is now moving their central operations here. So I just don't want to be here when that clamp comes because they're going to clamp. At least How that's long my until opinion. the uh, financial collapse? Because I mean, that that's inevitable. It has to happen. We're trillions of dollars in debt. We've been trillions of dollars in debt for decades now. Well, look and what we, they just did to the your generation. They just wiped your generation out in the cryptocurrency. I know of three people who committed suicide last week. Um, they got wiped out. And I tried to tell people this in the industry six years ago. The, the, the cartels are never going to allow a fiat currency to exist outside their control. And when the cryptocurrency took grave, it went faster than they could move but they were never going to allow it to be what it, what people thought it was going to be. Yeah. And so they've wiped a, that industry out. There, there's a certain billionaire. I'm not going to say his name, but he's been promoting Bitcoin for the last year. And um, I'm going to say that I think he might be selling all of his Bitcoin right now. And Michael uh, Saylor. I'm watching some of his movements and we're going, Hmm. What's he doing here? And I think he's getting out. And I think he's the one that's driving everything down. Well, you know, so with me... Biden doing two things that I, disturbs me, number one, he invoked the Wartime Act on production. So now the United States no longer has a free food processing aspect. It's now under federal control. This is federalism on steroids. And when you see this, along with what we're seeing as well, he also signed the executive order forcing all the cryptocurrencies into basically a U.S. Treasury crypto coin. Yeah. David said something really important in there, though, about like what is going to replace the uh, current financial system. Uh, how do you what do you think that's going to look like, David? Do you think it's going to be a digital kind of ID, uh, passport kind of surveillance system, or do you think it's going to be something different? I can give you an answer after this. Okay, Wayne, you seem to be in tune with that. All right, so here's the prediction that I talked to some people up in the CME and they hold GEM seats up there as being on the having a board seat in the CME and also the CBOE. So what they were saying already is the amount of corn that is going to come up and stand for delivery, which means people with the paper contracts are going to walk in and put it on the desk and say, I want my physical corn. 
they're already anticipating being so much demand for physical delivery that they already understand that they can't deliver at that level. So what's that gonna do when it comes to physical wheat and physical corn? And instead of taking cash settlement on the futures market, uh, you know, 35 to 50% of all contract holders demand physical delivery and they won't be able to facilitate that and there won't be enough rail cars and the actual real hard, you know, bushels of corn, tons of corn won't be there for delivery. I mean, I was told that that's going to break the system completely. Does that really have legs behind it? That if they can't deliver on all the contracts for physical, that it would break the system economically first. And that would be a catalyst for everything to snowball downhill. Yes. Yes. If you looked at what the mercantile is in the futures are. Yeah. All time highs. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I, 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 I guess to me, as a common man, I, I was taught in economics, there's only so much that the bubble can expand before it breaks. And there's pressure coming in from everywhere. And food, as we've talked here now for well over an hour, it really comes down to this food is what it's all about. Yep. And didn't Henry Kissinger say in 1976 that it would be the future would be dependent on food? Yep. Who controlled the food, controlled the world? Yep. That's, that's a little bit why they're retreating uh, and coming back into the United States, because the elites now believe that the United States may be the only country that will be able to produce food of any quality, quantity over the next few years. Um, and, but that's dicey, too, because we're having our own weather problems. So, um, yeah, they're 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 killing the system. You know, they they are, and um, there's no doubt about it. I had uh, 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 an intelligence guy on my show right before the 2020 election, and he said, "If Trump gets elected, everything will be fine. If Biden gets elected, there'll be massive die-off." <laughs> and I went, "Wow!" And uh, so that's still up there. So, you know, he was right. As a massive die-off. I've had no more people that have died in the last year than, you know, and not older people, younger people than I've known in my whole life. Yeah, I've heard that. David, I want to, I want to finish the question you asked me directly. So I have a contract. You can't deliver on that. So I'm going to take physical possession. It becomes real interesting then is that uh, it's the, the, the point as to who, who holds the actual product. I mean, what we're dealing with right here is paper. And you asked, Ryder, what would be the intermediary? It's, it's digital. I mean, it's already into the system. The 2010 Wall Street Reform Act already laid the groundwork. Uh, if they need the assets, all they're going to do is take our physical assets. I've been told that Biden is considering an executive order that if any American has more than three days worth of food in their house, that that will be considered to be a federal crime. Well, the other I mean, thing back to that so grain silos are holding in the regional, as so any regional area, a small county area, the grain silos are going to be holding the harvest until they find transpo to get it out of their facilities, generally by rail. If but they don't have point, the rails, yeah, the though, you know, CSX is, you know, we know what Union Pacific is doing. They're taking the cars off the rails. Yeah, be and SNF as well. Yeah. Well, how are you going to, what's the point of transporting that grain if the processing plants are all being blown up or nobody is willing to work or there's no money to pay them? Uh, that's the, uh, the whole thing relies on somebody processing, processing something for you to eat. And what I think it's going to come down to is we're going to have to grow our own. We're going to have to process our own. People do not know how to get food from the field to the table. Anymore. I live in a subdivision upper, you know, I won't say what it is, but I can tell you my neighbors think I'm nuts. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and uh, but these people have a hard time boiling water I don't and, and you're, you're you're talking about telling them to grill you know wheat berry and you know to grow their crops i mean the growing their crops here is a green lawn wow oh my i mean you know, that, that, i'm just being honest that's 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 the neighborhood i live in yeah. Okay. If you haven't thought ahead to the whole process, you know, I have a, a grain grinder 
an electric one you plug in but I also have one that works by hand because one of the things I see is that there are these rolling blackouts and sometimes things go down for a long period of time um, what do you do then what's what do you turn to then who's going to save you at that point you have to live as if you are totally self-sufficient and and you have one leg in that world and then the other leg you enjoy you know the the world that everybody else is in as much as possible but it takes a lot of time and a lot of energy to be your own producer your own farmer your own gardener you know build your own place take care of your own um everything that's why we're leaving the uh, the the subdivision. We're going out to the country because if you have taken the time to prepare, and yeah. all of a sudden the blackouts happen, all of a sudden the, uh, the 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 supply chain really does collapse. People are not being able to get their milk, their coffee, and you're sitting there drinking a hot cup of coffee. All your preparation becomes a big billboard. That's right. Guess what? We've been prepping, and you know I don't trust my neighbors. I don't know them. I don't want to know them, but that's just how it is. Yeah. So all and right, y'all are smiling. Thing. Maybe I'm the only asshole here, but the way I look at it is that no. I, I feel that, you know, you know, when, when we're bringing in the five gallon buckets, you know, because that's what we do and your neighbors start looking at you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. Anyway, and I, I think another thing that's worth mentioning, um, when you were talking about the barium and all the stuff, or David was mentioning the pesticides and the herbicides, the stuff being sprayed in order to be able to grow food, um, all of that, all that pesticide herbicide stuff is very volatile and it has to be stabilized with heavy metals. So you're spraying that on the field, that kills the life in the field, the pesticide does, and then the plant takes up the heavy metals and then the humans eat that. Now we're full of this stuff that changes consciousness. Do we and want to survive? That's the question. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's my question. I guess, Ryder, it's your show, but I'm asking, do we really want to survive this? I know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The ride through is going to be amazing, especially when the uh, plasma starts holding. Exactly. The skies and we see petroglyphs living in front of us again. How exciting is that? Yeah. Can't wait. Yeah. yeah right. That's going to be amazing. <laughs> well, this large comet SW30 that's supposed to be coming at May 30th or so. It could be up to a thousand uh, meteorites per hour coming through the atmosphere, or it could be nothing. But with all these changes we're seeing, it's interesting that they say this could be one of the biggest meteor showers in the last hundred years or 200 years, depending if you look at the 1816 lithographs. But on the timing of it all, it seems like, well, we're in for one to like shock and awe people of the night sky and how that might occur. Now, back to that cosmic ray thing that you were mentioning, you know, the higher the altitude, the more effect you'll have from cosmic rays. So those in the mountains, and this goes back to pre-dynastic Egypt as well. A few myths and legends uh, were talking about the people on the tops of the hills were fried. And then the comets came in and hit the oceans and caused tidal waves. So those at sea level were also in a bad position. So there was this little Goldie's, Goldilocks zone between being too high, fried by the cosmic rays, or too low to get wiped out by the tsunami that was apparently 800 to 1,000 feet tall. So somewhere lies in between. And again, you know, at the higher altitude, if you're in California or up in Nepal or somewhere, you might, or I should say Colorado and, and Nepal, some of these places like this, Andes Mountains. Yeah. Maybe you want to come down from altitude and get a little bit lower, but stay off the sea coasts. We Where got look at land that has cave? a cave on it. Yeah. It actually had, no, it does. That's why we got it. It has a physical cave on it. Oh. We have uh, caves all around us here. Yeah. It has its own water source inside it. So, you know, wow. if I, it, I don't know if that's got far enough underground, but we thought about this because the cosmic rays, as they get further into the, the atmosphere, you know, they get into heavy, dense particles. And, you know, that ain't good either for the DNA. But anyway. I have uh, one last uh, kind of uh, question here for everyone before we uh, wrap it up. We've been on here for almost an hour and a half now, and I appreciate all your guys' time. But we're going to get a little <clears throat> we're going to get a little woo woo right now, and uh, because I think a lot of this uh, is happening because of the suppression of technology, right? Um, from greedy humans that 
we've had since World War II. And we, you know, just now have our government coming out and saying that UFOs uh, are real or that they are unidentified. Uh, what do you guys think the uh, agenda is behind this? I, I think the ones that are uh, releasing this um, filmed UFOs is our military. Uh, it's just our craft. But what do you think that they are planning um, with releasing and saying that these UFOs are all of a sudden real? They've been covering it up for decades and it's taken them 60, 70 years to finally come out and say, oh, yeah, we don't know what they are. So do you think it's uh, some kind of staged alien invasion like uh, Warner Von Braun was talking about on his deathbed or others like... Um, Randy Kramer have been seen because I honestly think that's the only way that I can see them being able to release this technology in the open. Uh, well, Decentralized yeah, think, power. Yeah. I think that- Yeah, because uh, it moved in the new system. If we are gonna stay on a, a, a some sort of blockchain based document system, or if we do keep cryptocurrency or central bank digital currency, one of these drawbacks we're talking about is too much power consumption to solve the algorithms or too much power consumption in the entire okay well if you have decentralized power and we don't need these centralized systems anymore you know you find two disks that spin against each other using magnets running off the earth's magnetic field to generate power you know then everybody can still have power there can still be a society but you don't need to rely on the centralization because the frequency pattern is going to change where centralized systems aren't in that pattern anymore right centralized is and that, i'll leave it at that but yeah, how would they get from there? Because that UFO dump, the 10,000 documents, I think the CIA had left, uh, talked about anti-gravitics and sort of free zero point power included in these spacecraft. And that was, I think, sort of a soft leak into this tech is out here. Tesla Technologies, because I was in Zagreb in Croatia and went to the Nikola Tesla laboratory and I saw no less than 16, 16 magnetic motors that were functional in that right there. So I um, might, yeah. It was shocking that the, the, the tech has to be released somehow to move to this new carbon credit based world as well. So these new pillars of the economy of gold, silver, cryptocurrency, carbon allocation credits, personal allocation credits, and then digitizing of the world's forests and digitizing of lands of the ecosystem and then of oceans and protein supplies is going to have to be on some sort of blockchain. They're going to need to run it with power. And this will be it, I think, just. And Jay, you were shaking your head, so I think you get the same thing. It's about decentralized yeah. power. I know a lot of people that are building uh, magnetic motors right now. Um, like I said, it's all part of 10 years ago, you would have gotten shot um, or killed or something. Now there's such chaos that people are doing it, but they're just not announcing it anymore. They're just keeping it at their local, on their farm or on their ranch, and they're not making a big thing out of it. So uh, I think that's kind of where we're gonna have to go with it. We're just gonna do it ourselves and and and, and screw them. And, um, and, and we don't really have to tell them much about what we're doing. Uh, you know, another thing that's gonna happen here real soon is each, uh, as you guys all know, our government agencies receive contracts uh, budgets, right? And they can't exceed that budget until the next year. And their budgets are all being eaten up by energy right now. So the, uh, we don't think we have to worry about anybody coming out and inspecting us or anything. It's going to be too dang expensive for them to drive around pretty soon. So the governments are going to really just slowly shut down and uh, they're going to try to take over the digital world. Um, and, but we can resist that world. So I, I see, uh, like David said, we're going to be creating our own energy devices on our own property and on our own land, and people are going to start selling them or giving the plans out for free very soon here. I know a, a person who has enough money, and he's doing it. He's, you know, he's going to give it out for free. So you'll be able to get the plans and make your own uh, free energy devices. Those already exist. You can buy a unit from Cash and plug it into your house, it supplies electricity for your whole house, and you don't even need the grid. The work that, I can't even pronounce his name, the guy who made the five-hour energy drink, Minaj uh, something or other, um, he's a billionaire, and so he decided to devote 99% of his money to making the world a better place. Well, he picked three things. One was water, one was fertilizer, 
and the other was um god what was the other thing it'll come to me in a minute but he ended up um oh it was, it was portable solar units so you take your energy with you this portable solar unit charges your phone your computer your television and produces electric light for 24 hours and it's as big as a lunch box does everybody know what a lunch box is it's kind of an old-fashioned concept but um those the the water doesn't matter if it's brackish water or sewage turns that into perfectly clear clean drinkable water in no time and it's portable unit you take it wherever you go and then the fertilizer you know for anybody who's not a farmer fertilizer typically good compost takes uh six months really good compost a year for leaf mold and things like that if you leave it alone but um he's got finished compost in 18 days and they are he's teaching people how to build it's called um you probably heard of it billions and change too he had a thing out there last year i guess another video uh, billions and change one but this is billions and change two um all of that says that we don't need those big centralized systems anymore um people are buying rvs and they're buying fifth wheels and they're buying tiny houses on wheels and all kinds of stuff and they are taking their electric and their water um, right with them wherever they go they're already working remote we're headed toward a very mobile society um, that changes taxation taxation if there's no taxation changes government changes education it changes everything and being more self-sufficient uh, maybe we'll get a little healthier um, if we're not eating all that processed crap and um, and we won't age as fast we'll be healthier much much longer so I see you know the energy is there of course not very many people are talking about it but it's out there if you're looking um, and I think that that's going to hit like a like one of those tsunamis except it's going to be a tsunami of new energies regardless of what ufos are doing and i have quite a bit of background with ufos and plasma technology and how that runs and people who are developing motors are still using the old concept but it's still a good stepping stone it's uh you you know what you discover is you don't need a motor you don't need an engine um, you need to be able to utilize energy and direct energy. And there's quite a bit of stuff out there that is uh, in patents that has been suppressed. There's quite a bit of technology that just uses energy. We used it in the lab. It is phenomenal. You know, what are we doing with all this old-fashioned tech? So I kind of welcome that UFO stuff, even though they're, they're way behind way behind the government is way behind absolutely wayne you have anything for us bring us on i'll be the the downer if if <laughs> et exists i think maybe this is maybe eit the inner part but that kind of brings on then is there basically all the same species is there a same agenda going on here that works for them i don't know but what i do get a sense that I don't see the sunshine and lollipops. I see a very dark, dark time coming for us, particularly in the United States. I don't know about the rest of the globe because the only one thing I can make relate, relate to is here. I think that if we survive this, those who survive it are going to emerge into a hell. Um, the infrastructure will be collapsed. Uh, we saw very quickly what war can do in a civilized country like Ukraine, how they can bomb the crap out of it and make a subdivision into a disaster area. If, if our government is collapsing, and, and there's a lot of evidence to show that our government is, um, anarchy always fills the void initially because there's a power struggle. And I got to tell you, I don't know who the good guys are and who the bad guys are anymore. Yeah. Um, I know congressmen, I know senators, I know judges, and they don't know anymore. 
And that's troubling for me as a citizen, realizing that I'm seeing already an economic collapse, a tsunami coming that can't be stopped. There are going to be millions of people in this country that are going to go hungry. Millions more are going to be wiped out financially. And the vast majority of these people are not enlightened at all. They're totally dependent upon this government. And when that collapses, it's not going to be a safe place unless you are in a smaller community. And that's just me. I hope ET writer is real. I hope that maybe they may have compassion, but I've never seen intelligence and compassion be side by side. Um, intelligence is cold. And that's what I'm seeing. Everything I see in, in, in YouTube channels, on the headlines, is devoid of love. It's devoid of hope. It's devoid of compassion. What it's full of is fear. And that leads into where everyone becomes fearful. And that's what I'm seeing. So if ET exists, I hope they come down and tell us, like in the day the earth stood still. Maybe Klaatu will come out and say, this is the gift to humanity. I just hope we don't shoot him in the process. <laughs> Right now, I just wanted yes. to add uh, before uh, before we close out that um, I think one of the the answers is, uh, you know, individual sustainable communities that folks like us are able to start up on our own. I'm starting to uh, have a couple of affiliates that are doing that. Jim Gale with Food Forest Abundance. And I would highly encourage anyone that would like to get if, if they are if you are starting to do something like this, if you're starting to start your own sustainable communities and you want to get the word out there contact me i'm trying to bring together individuals like this who are starting sustainable communities around the united states so there can be some kind of a link up between them and because uh, i think that's one of the answers that will get us through this you know apocalyptic scenario good for you <laughs> yeah really uh, I, i'm the spot on that, that that's fantastic chris yeah, so because I know Jim, I know Jim also. He, we did an interview together, and right now I'm putting up a fence around the two and a half acres in the front of our property here, and it's two by three welded wire, galvanized, but I got the PVC coated so it's green and it blends in. But uh, Jim's given me a list of plants, and I'm going to put 1,200 feet of you know, climbing plants through the fence there. And we're going to start with that, and the other uh, half of the acreage is going to be wine vines on the. Uh, on the wire coming across. So I think about 1200 vertical line feet of grow space of climbing veg from chayote to Malabar spinach, the beans, of course, the tomatoes linked in there. I mean, you want a lot of food, <laughs> ready to line and a Any lot grapes? of you know, people who don't know it, they might walk right by it. And, you know, if you, when I will say something right here, we are gonna have to make these choices because you don't know who the good guys or the bad guys are. But the bad guys are going to be somebody at your front door making you either try to leave your house or break in your house to get your resources. At that point, everything in your life changes at that second, and it will never be the same again. That choice, you better mentally be ready to take it because at one day you're going to have to make that choice. I talked to some special ops guys who are my neighbors here, two different guys, and they did some time in Somalia. And then another guy was a Vietnam War vet. But they kept telling me both identically the same thing. If an intruder or if somebody gets in there, whether it be an intruder with a uniform, as soon as they make entry into your house, the chances of you surviving that or getting out of there are about 15%. And especially on the more uh, end of breaking in to try to get food supplies and that sort of thing and, and a hostile takeover of a premises or vehicle theft, your chances are 15% if they enter your house, if you're getting out of there alive. So put those odds in and when they come knocking or there's something that goes down, the police are going to be so stretched anyway that you're going to have to make your own choices and being out in the farmer's community like we are here, they would just blink an eye and they would get a tractor and dig a hole and that's all they would do. And that's been talked about here. And, you know, our conversation here, which most people might think is a woo woo far out. That's just normal conversation that you hear. Most people here that understand it's broken and we got to take care of ourselves. I don't care if it's a 90 year old farmer sitting down at Hardy's in the morning talking about the old times, but see things just matching up here. Or if it's some, uh, you know, newer generation of farmers and even kids now, everybody sees something's out. So these farming communities are pulling together as well. And Wayne, one last thing, you know, your economic collapse. What's the timeline on that, do you think? 
Like we're talking this year sometime. This yeah, year. we're already in it. We're already in it. it it's the, the veil has already started to be um, dropped on us. How does that go for property taxes then? Because that's another thing. They're going to try to swoop your property if you don't have gold or silver to be able to transfer into whatever fiat of the day or, or the moment of the valuation of the fiat is to be able to pay your property taxes. Because even during the Great Depression, they took people's homes again and again and again and tried to have the penny sales out in the, car, in the farmlands. David, it's odd, odd that you mentioned that was one of the things that we looked at where we're moving was the property taxes on that because we can own the property, but if the state taxes us to the point where they compensate the uh, the property, then we're homeless. I think that's where the revolution is going to come as well. We don't talk about those things out in the public, but people are getting fed up with that because basically I'm paying for uh, services that my family, my generations, or even those around me are not getting. We're giving it to outsiders, foreigners coming in. And I think most American people are getting fed up with that. We, you know, it's like, I don't mind paying taxes, but let it do to what it's supposed to do. Isn't some David, of the highest I, property tax on the state may go for your uh, food. I think they may, <laughs> they may take a trade, you know, seriously. You had a 50 pound bag of pinto beans, maybe that will pay your property taxes for a year. <laughs> Why? Keep the mason jar. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> the bonus just for you. Does uh, anybody else have anything else to, uh, that they would like to comment on before we, uh, before we wrap it up here today? This has been fun. Yeah, mm -hmm. been fun. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you guys so much. I appreciate you all more than you know. And, uh, you know, thank you so much for helping me out uh, during this time. And I um, uh, don't know where I would be or what I'd be doing without you guys. So I'm going to give you all time to uh, let the audience know where they can find you. Uh, Chris, where can they find you online, my friend? Uh, easiest way, everything is on our website, forbiddenknowledge.news. We're on all podcast platforms. Our premium stuff is on Rockfin. You can get, go there, rockfin.com slash FKN plus to sign up. Uh, we're limited on YouTube. We only mainly post clips on there and Odyssey. And I think that's about it. David, where can they find your content, my friend? Uh, the Mini Ice Age Conversations podcast, similar on any podcast platform across the net. The Adapt 2030 channel, which I'm shadow banned on. So we've moved over to Brighteon, which is Mike Adams' site, BitChute, Odyssey, and Rumble. And Thursday nights, 10 p.m. to midnight. On Thursdays, Revolution Radio Studio A, Ransom Godwin and myself uh, broadcast out and live stream across four platforms along with the radio program. So yeah, this limitation of being able to operate in a, in a social conversation being limited by these tech platforms is a little frustrating, but please support all of our work because we're all going through the same thing, trying to spend our time to get the information to you to help your family stay safe during these changes and tech platforms wanna limit that conversation so you as an average listener, I would be a little irked at the tech platforms of trying you not to allow you and your families to be more safe during the time. They're trying to keep you unsafe and unprepared, where we're all trying to bring you information to keep you and get you prepared, allow you to do your own research, think for yourselves and come up for your own solutions for you, not the media telling you what you have to do. The information's in your court now. It's time for you to run with it. Absolutely. Wayne, uh, where can they find you? On YouTube, R. Wayne Steiger. I'm also on Odyssey, Rumble, and um, Brighton as well. I just signed up on that one. So, mm -hmm. a good one. Yeah. Yeah. So, that's it. Jay, <laughs> Jay, my friend, where can they find your work? Uh, uh, JayWidener.com and uh, Reality Check on YouTube. And I'm also moving over to Odyssey and BitChute. I haven't done it yet, but they haven't censored me yet, but I can feel it coming. And um, yeah, it really sucks to have to curb your language to uh, so, so you don't offend some 25 year old working at a high tech company. Especially after our show, our last show together. <laughs> uh, Penny, yeah. uh, where, where can they get your work at? Oh, let's see. I, well, um, YouTube, I've got a lot of videos on YouTube, on Odyssey, on uh, Patreon, Penny, uh, Patreon slash Penny Kelly. Um, I have a website, consciousnessonfire.com, and all my books are on Amazon. So any of those, and then all the podcasts. 
links to everyone's channel will be in the description of this video. I highly recommend everyone taking the time to go and support, subscribe uh, to their work and to their channels to help support them. They're amazing individuals and I'm very lucky to know them and uh, talk to them here today. Thank you all very much. I had a really great time with you all here tonight and I hope you all did too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.